questions in chat, that's fine too. Before we begin, I should do all of the formal stuff. So I acknowledge that Castle Main Library is on Jajarang country and I extend my appreciation for the Jajarang people, the traditional owners of the land that we gather on. I pay my respects to leaders and elders past, present and emerging for they hold the memories, the traditions and the culture and the hopes of all the Jajarang peoples. I express my gratitude in the sharing of this land, my sorrow for the personal, spiritual and cultural costs of that sharing and my hope that we may walk forward together in harmony and the spirit of healing. And, oh, sorry, I thought I just saw someone else pop in, but no. Um, now, uh, we're very lucky to have Ruth McIver here with us just before she dashes off to WA, as she's been trying to for quite some time. Um, that's also part of the reason why uh, Ruth is online rather than in person as originally planned, just so she doesn't get caught in quarantine and get stuck here again. So I hope we can all understand that's a very good reason for Ruth to be online. Um, and it's also great for the people who often can't come um, into the library at the moment, because we're still one of the places that has to be strict about um, vaccination status too. So some of the people who can't come to um, live events still come to these, which is great. So um, very short intro on Ruth. Ruth is an Aussie writer. Um, she was born in Dublin, has lived all over the place. Um, she has ties to Melbourne and Perth. Um, she's written for the Sunday Age, The Big Issue, um, and the poetry journal Cordite. She's got a doctorate in crime fiction and her inaugural crime novel, I Shot the Devil, won the Rochelle Prize for Emerging Writers, which you can see just behind her <laughs> shoulder there. Um, we're lucky to have managed this sneak event just before she leaves. Um, and I'd like to very warmly welcome Ruth. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. That was such a nice welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and this is my first library talk um, with this book, as I was just saying before to Stuart, which is really wonderful and I'm really happy I could do it in um, such a beautiful place and it's it seems like a really fitting thing to do just before I leave. Um, uh, it's a nice way to feel well a very beautiful place. Um, so yeah I am um, I am very passionate about libraries. I um, read my way through the library when I was a little kid um, and I used to beg my mum to go back and get more books and me and my brother would just keep reading them. So, um, you know, uh, very love, very, very, very grateful to um, be here to talk to you all. Um, so I thought, you know, you've done a little bit of an intro about me and my life. Um, so maybe I'll just talk a little bit about my book, um, I Shot the Devil. Um, so this is it. Um, got some very nice endorsements on the front. Um, so it's actually, I guess you could call it a, a crime thriller or a literary crime thriller. I'm not really um, too caught up in those distinctions. Um, it's also a little bit hard boiled, a um, bit noir. Um, it's set in 1994 and 2010 in a fictional town called Southport. Um, the, the novel follows my flawed journalist protagonist Erin Sloan who's tasked with writing about writing a commemorative feature for a magazine called Inside Island about a 16 year old satanic murder in an idyllic Long Island community a sensational case called the Southport Three. Unbeknownst to her editor Erin is not just a former resident of Southport but was in fact intimately involved with not one but two of um, the key players in the murder of Andre Villiers. So uh, despite her um, initial reservations, um, she decides to dig into the crime to find out what happened on that night that Andre Villiers was murdered. And in doing so, she has to uh, you know, excavate her own troubled past. And disturbing old ghosts becomes incredibly dangerous for her because as the investigation ramps up, so does the threat to her life. Um, the novel weaves elements of memoir and true crime with crime fiction. Um, and I hoped that it would highlight um, the cultural obsession with rewriting and resolving the traumas of our past. Um, it also has a very strong um, narrative thread about victimhood and survival um, it exposes domestic and sexual violence that underlies the female experience. Erin uh, Sloan's testimony and, an, um, and a parallel narrative authored by one of the Southport Three called, and the, the, the narrative is called Resident Alien, 
weaves a narrative of broken childhoods, abusive relationships, and rape culture in the 90s. In this sense, I refer to I Shot the Devil as hashtag me too crime fiction. Um, so, you know, with all of that in mind, it is, and I always have to sort of give a little disclaimer that there's always like a little bit of a content warning or a trigger warning. Um, a lot of people think that's because um, you know, satanic murder, and I, I do use the quotation marks um, for a reason, um, that is going to be incredibly grisly, incredibly violent, um, you know, that sort of thing. Um, whereas it's actually not really a very violent book, but it does deal with some really dark themes. Um, and for me, I was always really fascinated with the occult being um, uh, a good Catholic <laughs> I was always really interested, especially growing up in the 80s, um, always really into um, heavy metal um, and bands like ACDC. In fact, I named my first cat Angus after Angus Young. Um, my brother was like a full metal head. We grew up in a very religious, um, uh, I guess my mum was quite religious. She was uh, going to be a, a nun. And then she decided that she would not, so she could have children. And then she did some photographic modeling for Irish Women's Day. Um, and so, yeah, we grew up with a lot of um, religion. We went to a pretty strict Catholic school and being the eighties, even though it was Western Australia, there was a huge amount of satanic um, panic stuff going on. My brother drew a picture of um, the priest, like, you know, uh, giving the Eucharist. And so he had his hands up in the air and it was meant to resemble um, a Metallica um, cover, but uh, he got <laughs> he got severely punished. Um, we were forced into counselling and things like that because um, you know they thought that it was a hallmark of of uh, Satanism and things like that, where it was just were really um, just very influenced by that aesthetic, and you know obviously it had no meaning to us in an occult sense. Um, so that, those sort of things and that kind of music and subculture really influenced um, my writing. And, you know, it's always been a kind of like, music has been a lifelong love of mine. Um, so that's really incorporated into the book. Um, with the actual um, like subgenre, I guess, of crime fiction that I write about and what the novel is based on, I actually write, I, I guess I would refer to it as true crime inspired fiction. So. I usually don't use one primary crime or I do use, uh, sorry, I'll rephrase that. I, I often use a primary crime, but I um, basically fictionalize all the elements of it, except for the impact the crime had at the time. So what it speaks of the cultural milieu, um, not the details, not the nitty gritty. I change ages, I change gender, I change location, I change setting. Um, so for me, when I first discovered the case of Ricky Casso, it was kind of when I was, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a true crime nut, um, as many of us are. Um, so I was trawling around on YouTube, um, just sort of in the, the um, YouTube true crime corridors, and I um, discovered this case called about this, this guy called Ricky Casso. And they referred to him as the Acid King. Um, and it was a crime in 1985. One of the things that really struck me about it, um, you know, the, the title was kind of like clickbait, but it was, you know, Satan in the suburbs. And um, it was also really intriguing to me because the images were really striking, but the area, um, the town, um, this beautiful um, picturesque hamlet um, was, in a different county, but on the same island that I grew up on, um, in, sorry, um, in my, so say from 10 to 14. And I'd been wanting to write something that was about um, the island, about Long Island and Long Island crimes. So it was just quite kind of serendipitous that I found this story. So I started doing some research and I found out about um, this this crime and the New York Times, for example, were describing it as a ritual killing followed out by members of a satanic cult. And when I was reading about it, the, the pictures of, you know, of Ricky Casso were just crazy. His eyes were bulging out of his head. Um, you know, he he looked completely crazed. Um, the, the headlines were like, say you love Satan, which is allegedly what um, 
Ricky Casa said to his victim, um, Gary Lowers, who was brutally murdered um, with a group, by a group of teens in the woods um, when they were on PCP. The whole case revolved around psychedelics and the whole trial, in fact, re revolved around psychedelics and um, people's memory um, and teenagers' memories, um, which you see in things like true crime podcasts like Serial. Um, one of the things that really struck me about that in the very beginning of that podcast was um, the host was saying, you know, I tried to ask my nephew, my teenage nephew, where he was at this time, you know, last week, and he couldn't remember. So these, these teenagers were on so many, um, you know, I think I had like 15 tabs of acid, PCP, magic mushrooms, angel dust, um, and Ricky Castor, obviously the, the acid king, um, was, you know, on, on so many um, that, uh, and obviously he was, you know, a very unrepentant murderer, but no one knew who actually started to, you know, harm Gary Lowers. No one know, who, knew who the actual killer was, even though it was clear he was kind of the ringleader. There was a lot of posturing about the teenagers, you know, that um, a lot of people were saying these things, you know, well, actually they were just teenagers who just went to the woods and they used to smoke dope and they wanted to look scary and um you know maybe they sacrifice a squirrel or something like that and you know then the story starts to come out that you know there's very you know while Ricky Casso was a very disturbed young man with occult kind of pretensions um there was very little satanic activity going on and it was really about a you know the murder was kind of about a, a drug debt and um, what was also really interesting to me was that Ricky Casso really looked a lot like Richard Ramirez and the way that Richard Ramirez, um, a famous American serial killer around that same time, really similar um, posturing and image. And Richard Ramirez became a celebrity kind of, um, he was also, you know, kind of shockingly handsome, but, you know, in a kind of grotesque way. Um, and Ricky Casso's image was all over skateboard decks. He was on the cover of Rolling Stone. Um, it probably helped that he um, killed himself in police custody because it added to this kind of mythology surrounding him. And this kind of story just really captured my imagination because I just thought, what an amazing, a, an amazing kind of sensational story. Like what was really going on there? Like, um, you know, and that's what I'm interested in like I'm not I'm not a historian um, as such. I'm like more of a cultural historian in the sense that I want to know what crimes speak about a society and what they they speak about a specific place and era, and and more more so what the media's uh, narrating and the story that uh, the media is circulating and what that speaks about our anxieties and obsessions and our fears and our worries. Um, so I was really influenced by that case and I based some of my um, crime around um, the Ricky Casso case of the Southport Three um, and using those kind of elements of things like um, unreliable, well, obviously um, faux occultism um, and satanic posturing and heavy metal and that sort of thing, but also looking at things like um, false memory and confabulation, which was a huge theme. Um, in the satanic panic, um, especially around abuse and child, child abuse. And obviously these themes are really perennial because if you look now like QAnon and all of that sort of thing, we're seeing the satanic panic being recycled just in a different um, form. Another thing that really interested me was, um, you know, I, I watch a lot of documentaries um, on miscarriages of justice. And one of those was the West Memphis Three and the case of the West Memphis Three. And I was really influenced by that. Um, and, you know, if and when you read the book, you'll you'll see the elements besides from the obvious of naming the Southport Three. Um, it was a real nod to the West Memphis Three, but also that, you know, we, we want to read dominant culture wants to, um, well, first of all, they love a youth panic, they love a teen panic. Um, but they want to hold on to a tangible evil. Um, and there's also this sort of fear of youth um, and fear of um, evil. And yet at the same time, uh, oftentimes the people, um, as is the case of the West Memphis Three, is not being, the evil isn't being perpetrated by the children and the youth. It's actually being perpetrated by the authorities, by the families. Um, and, uh, you, you know, obviously that was a terrible miscarriage of justice. Um, also, with true crime inspired fiction, which is kind of what I would describe my um, this book and all the other manuscripts I've written um, 
some of which might be coming out soon, some of which uh, <laughs> exist, but I don't know when they're coming out, um, uh, are about basically um, capturing the story truth. Um, that's a, a phrase from author Tim O'Brien, um, who, you know, was really interested in how Vietnam and the reportage of Vietnam uh, differed from, say, the novelist's experience of Vietnam um, and how, say, story truth contrasts to what he refers to as the happening truth, you know, the official records and, um, and that sort of thing. But what is the voice of the people in the community, the voice of the people who experience the trauma, um, the ripples and the after effects and the aftershocks? And so, you know, he says story truth can actually be truer than happening truth or official truth. And a lot of historians now kind of look towards that in, in the form of like say diaries and things like that, um, because say court records are very partisan and you know, uh, you don't hear the voice of the victim. And, and some authors actually, you know, especially crime authors are interested in the story of the villain um, too, or the murderer and um, you know, Historically, that's easier for us to stomach, I think, because we have less of an emotional um, reaction um, when we're talking about someone who's committed a crime, um, especially when it's like a violent one, for example. Um, obviously, there are a lot of ethical issues with um, story, uh, with, you know, fictionalizing or narrativizing crime. Um, and there's a lot of things which I you know, really have to think about a lot when I'm uh, fictionalizing true crime events. Um, I also have to be really careful with like contamination because, um, you know, when you're writing, you have so much of your subconscious just sort of um, informing um, your writing and, and you're not really quite sure where some of it comes from. And um, I was writing something recently and realized that I had put something as in like actually injected um, a murder, a modus operandi that was from a true crime case that I didn't really think I'd really even thought about into a book and it was a really um, prominent theme and I just didn't even know where that had come from and you start to think of the victims as characters which is actually a really you know dehumanizing thing and and it shouldn't happen um, so what I try to do is create a collage of crime events so that the reader knows that I'm referring to what the crime symbolise rather than actually sort of exploiting the people that are involved. Because I'm not actually interested in glorifying or, um, you know, explaining away uh, an actual crime. I'm not engaging with it on that level because if I was, I'd be writing nonfiction. I just want to see um, what these crimes mean to us um, and, and how they affect our psyche collectively. Um, partly that's because I grew up in Perth, Western Australia around the time of the Claremont uh, murders, the disappearances and, and murders. And I was so impacted by that psychologically. Um, and I know so many people were, especially so many young women, you know, um, so many of us texting, uh, um, well, sorry, not texting, um, because we didn't have uh, uh, phones like at that time, but uh, well, some of us did. <laughs> not me, I had it later, but yeah, we were just letting people know we were home safe all the time. And then later on when we were texting all the time, texting the, um, you know, the cab's ID and then Uber, and then, you know, it's still a behavior um, that I enact. And that's been, it's been so long, it's been like 25 years. Um, so I, also someone who really followed the trial and um, attended the trial um, and wrote in a fictionalized way about a similar crime, I began to really see how, um, how easily you could tip over into something exploitative how important it is not to harm um, any um, victims of crime. And so I try to do this in a really ethical way and interrogate the way that I represent things. I also ensure that um, all the details are changed. I relocate things. Uh, and I often fade out where violence has occurred. So um, that's kind of the technique that I've been using um, with this 
with this manuscript and with other manuscripts. Um, obviously, you know, I do write things that are entirely invent are entirely invented, but this is kind of the thing that I'm really interested in. Um, there are other authors in Australia that I met that are doing a really similar thing with a similar similar purpose purposefulness. Um, but many crime writers obviously write about true crime um, inadvertently or they get an idea from a, a newspaper clipping. I think the difference is, is that, you know, um, I, I think I'm kind of uh, purposely combining cultural history, um, criminal history with um, fiction. So, yeah, but it, it is, um, it can make for um, a slightly hairy experience for, for me as an author because, you know, I can give myself a lot of um, concern and anxiety about, you know, uh, about that practice and, um, you know, another time recently I was uh, talking to someone on Twitter from America about this amazing crime documentary I'd seen and they just sort of texted and said, you know, oh, sorry, typed and said, oh, yeah, like I grew up with... Um, that girl and um she was really lovely she was my you know brother's friend and I just sort of thought oh my god like even recommending crime as like an entertainment um true crime as entertainment is is actually a really dubious kind of practice but it's been around forever like since you know serials like um you know it's it's something that as humans we're fascinated with and um I think it's important to acknowledge your own kind of ghoulishness on that level or your own intrigue or your own interest. And um, I, you know, I don't think there's anything um, untoward if you're doing it in a very conscious fashion. So um, that's a little bit about my creative process with I Shot the Devil. Um, and I thought I might do a little reading. Um, so I've, just got up to uh, chapter two. And this is where um, my narrator has just agreed to um, take on the story of the South Court Three, even though she's feeling really concerned about it. Um, and she returns, she's returning back to the island, which she hasn't been for, um, you know, about 16 years. So. I found myself back in my gunmetal grey Chrysler the Baron on autopilot to Roosevelt Fields Mall in Garden City. Could have easily gone to the Barnes and Noble in Westbury to buy a new notebook per my private ritual. New story, new notebook. This was not only a detour, but also my first return to Roosevelt Fields since 1994. As soon as I sighted the parking lot, I knew I'd made a mistake. Dread knotted my stomach, my palms began to sweat. Even my feet seemed to perspire. I'd forgotten how gargantuan the building was. It was the second largest mall in the state and spanned two stories plus a concourse level. The directory indicated new additions and excisions of older chain stores. In the 90s, Roosevelt Fields was like an airport and a destination in its own right. A kind of small insulated country where kids of all races commingled. It was also a coliseum. It was an arena where class and commerce lines bl blurred in what was otherwise a very segregated white bread part of the island. There were people packing guns. There were records and bookstores providing portals out of Southport and the island itself. A, a jungle of hormones and subcultures seething and sedated by bright strip lighting and R&B auto-tune music. I exited the car and walked half a mile from the parking lot into the entrance. I barely made it through the automated doors which opened onto a Hannigan's family restaurant. It was next to the cigarette machine at Hannigan's that I reached first base with Danny, but more memorably, it was adjacent to the Burger King where I first met Ricky, who seemed to be getting to third with Carol Jenkins. His hand jammed halfway up her, her denim cutoffs as she perched near catatonic on his knee. Ricky, Solomon black clad, opened his mouth up to accept the occasional greasy spring onion a spring spiral onion ring she offered like she was feeding a depressed crow. I recall him sitting on a backless swivel stool. His posture was poor. It occurred to me that he didn't know how to carry his height, but later I would learn that he had a problem with his back from a car wreck and he was sometimes hunched out of pain. He barely registered me as his glassy eyes went straight to the book I had just shoplifted from the same Barnes and Nobles I was heading to now. It was a small book of poems by Edgar Allan Poe from the Great American Poet series. Ricky shifted Carol off my lap and seized the book, reading aloud while I squirmed with embarrassment. It was night in the lonesome October of my most immemorial year. 
The press only got a hold of a few photos of the brooding, sneery teenage Ricky with his cut glass cheekbones and black eyes. In one, he's at a tux at a family wedding where he looks more like an Aztec king about to attend a sacrifice. His fleshy lips pursed in a scowl of moral disobedience, displaying extremely white teeth lined up like tombstones. When I got to know him, I found out that despite conscientious brushing, the perfect veneer disguised a mouth of eroded enamel, molars riddled with painful holes and craters. That day at the Burger King with the whites of his the white tops of his black eyes were showing and vicious acne scars marred his vaulting cheekbones. His ACDC t-shirt read thunderstruck. After lightning strikes, lights up the sky, residue will, will fall. Fulgurite, they call it. Arrow, meat hard. Ua lume, hey? He read the, the title as if tasting it. Then he looked at me. It was not my heart that took the hit, but somewhere lower, the gut, the small intestine even. Gay, Danny sighed. These were the days when my heart was volcanic, Ricky quoted. Brutal assault, he added, nodding, nodding at me in approval. There was a white blonde figure next, but behind him, wearing an army greatcoat and tinted John Lennon shades, holding a supersized milkshake that appeared doll sized in his giant hands. Andre Villiers. He could have been Ricky's astral body, a phantom, a ghost. Within a year, both boys would be dead. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> well, nice is maybe not the, the right word to describe someone who's about to die. <laughs> um, yeah, so if anybody has any questions for Ruth, um, feel free to turn on your camera and mic. Just remember we are recording or put them into chat. Um, if everybody's feeling shy, I do have a couple of quick ones. Uh, do you have any recommendations for true crime on YouTube that you've been watching? What's particularly good at the moment? <laughs> I have to say, I, I genuinely don't do much YouTube true crime at the moment because, and I'm not trying to, I'm not denigrating it. It's just, there's a lot of, um, <laughs> my dad's going to listen to this. <laughs> He'll send me like 10 links because he loves true crime. <laughs> and I'm like, I want to say to him, like, just curate it a bit because some mm. of them are really terrible. Like, you know. Um, yeah, very ghoulish and yeah. horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Really exploitative and awful um yeah like I, I i find that when i'm watching things that are more like they've been made a little bit more sensitively are a little bit better like there's so many good ones that are on like you know don't fuck with cats um that's amazing um the tinder swindler is really really good that's on netflix at the moment um that's brilliant um that's also i i love con stories so i've been really looking forward to the anna delvey um, show that's coming out on Netflix. I love like con men and people who have double identities and stuff like that. And it's also kind of like a little bit less harrowing. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of really good ones on Netflix about those. Um, I would recommend those documentaries. Um, another really good one that's not on um, Netflix is called, um, I think it's called There's Something Wrong With Aunt Diane. And it's um, really good because it's quite mysterious and it's, um, it's kind of about a suburban um, like soccer mum who um, has this catastrophic accident and sort of the filmmaker going back and sort of trying to discover what happened and just really interesting and yeah. And then there's always like, sorry, I'm going to go crazy because <laughs> like the staircase and the jinx, those are like the classic ones, I think. Um, but I like those kind of like off off kilter ones that are just a little bit like they're not so like bloody and gruesome and they're just more about a mystery so yeah <laughs> for someone who didn't have very many recommend recommendations yeah. you had a few. <laughs> don't watch dear zachary especially <laughs> with like someone in, this, in a very sad situation because that's just like just mm. yeah, so, <laughs> so no no to that <laughs> thank you for that um now we do have one question in chat um Sandra is curious to know more about your process for deciding which voice to write in and why you ended up in the first person. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, so I wrote another book, a manuscript before this, and um, it is not published, but um, I rewrote it maybe 14 times, maybe more. I, I'm, I'm not even going to lie. It's, it's monstrous. Um, and I went from first person to close third to omniscient. To da, 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 and then I kept, and I, I always have this thing. So I read a lot of like very tricky literary um, novels. 
Um, and they was there was always like, you know, rotating, you know, unreliable narrators. I always tried to make it really tricky. And then I had a writing teacher who's to say, when you're in first person is like, you know, like your head goes under the water. This is total submersion. And once I found that first person voice with Aaron, I just felt like the story just flo- It was like so natural. And I guess also it's my second book. So I went through it, the most excruciating growing pains you could imagine. Um, I definitely discovered that through sort of trial and error. But then after that, I'd written um, a third person book. I've written something in second and I think sometimes it is character, which is terrifying too. Um, <laughs> it's it's really character specific, but I think it's yeah. You've got it's so risky with first person because you really got to um, the readers either going to really love it or hate it. Like they're either going to really love the character, and I found that that's the kind of reviews I got with this book. Some people just hated it, and like they hated her. Mm. That uh, and and other people loved her, but you get that much more closely with a first person. You know the character so much more intimately, and it felt right for her. Um, you know, if I had third person, I think it would have really lost a lot of intimacy. So yeah, but yeah, generally yes. trial and error. But yeah, <laughs> sometimes just trusting your gut too. Yeah. Yes, I'm I'm just impressed with your bravery at trying second. That's. <laughs> I know. I mean, I remember reading Jay McInerney's, um, oh, which, yeah, he's he's done it a couple of times, actually, I think. But it was Bright Lights, Big City, I think, way back when. And, um, yeah, like, I remember thinking, wow, that's, that's kind of crazy. And, um, you know, uh, it does, it can work so well. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's very frightening. And I think also, you know, I never really realised how much so until I published a book um, because you really are asking people to do a lot when they're reading, like, and, and people have a much shorter attention span and they're a lot less tolerant these days, I think. I think we just have a lot more books too, um, a lot more options. And so people will kind of throw the book down. Um, so it's it's getting them. And sometimes second person, I don't know, if you could do the marathon, unless you do it really, really well. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's always the trick, doing it really, really well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's um, right. <laughs> now, look, look, sort of to, to bounce off that, um, you have these very visceral reactions to a first-person part, first person character where people either love them or they hate them. Um, yes. Have you found that that made, um, especially because you were saying it made it more in-depth, did you make, find that even harder dealing with the ethical considerations around the content matter because you were so inside her head going if you were going to raw real places did it risk going real so far that it was almost exploitative and that you were well, not because because she isn't one of the um characters so she's a completely fictional character so yeah and i did actually have someone say to me at one i, I do like a workshops for ethical um ethics in crime, like crime fiction that's inspired by true crime, but also crime memoir. Um, so, which is just like, it's my real area of interest. Um, so yeah, and they asked me with my protagonist, um, you know, did I get a sensitivity reader? And I was like, well, no, because like I'm a woman. <laughs> and I, I basically like, I, I don't know. I was like, I'm the sensitivity reader. <laughs> like it's, it was like, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not my main, my protagonist, but, um, and a lot of people have conflated me with her, but, um, I, with her experiences, they were all fictionalized. So, um, no, the only thing I think was that, that, um, you know, perhaps that was triggering to some readers and some people that was the risk more like, because she has gone through a lot of, um, you know, uh, violence, like a, a violent relationship. Um, she's had assault and she's had addiction. Um, so, yeah, so there's that. There's that. With the, um, I would never, with a writing in a victim's um, first person perspective, I, I think I would, unless it was fiction, it was actual fiction, I, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, that's, that'd be very tough to do. Don't keep. I, I have yeah. done that before I started really understanding and thinking about it and that's why I think even though like 
my PhD might not have gotten me heaps, <laughs> but like it really, really, really changed the way that I thought about things. Um, and it's, 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 I'm not saying that in a judgy way. Um, I'm not a censor, but it's just, it's just something I, I probably wouldn't do. Um, cause I just do, I try to do what feels right. Feels ethically like comfortable for me. So, yeah. Well, that's a good thing to being able to learn that you maybe you wouldn't do things the same way that you would have previously. That's growing. That's it's like, changing. It's changing me as a novelist because I yeah. really did. Um, I did a lot because I just thought about those issues and those things, and I studied books um, and studied texts that were reviewed really well. But that I thought, for example, like something a lot of people think really pulpy tri um, true crime books are unethical um, and they're badly written and stuff like that. But I've read a lot of highly literary books that um, uh, are deceptive ethically. Like, so the aesthetics um, kind of mislead because there's something suspect behind it. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, it's quite, it's something to really think about, like whether or not you're actually, I always kind of interrogate myself when I'm writing. I'm like, is that just a, like a lovely passage or like, but what's the impact and, and that sort of thing, so. Yeah, you can get away with a bit more if you if you're seen as coming from a serious place, even if it's not actually a sensitive it's literary. place. Literary, it's seen. Yeah. It's, it's definitely um, you you're given a greater leeway. And um, yeah, there was one book in particular. So it's interesting also because it's quite gendered. Um, a girl, a woman. Sorry, I shouldn't say girl. Um, but she was very young, like mid twenties. Wrote this book called um, Emma Klein. She wrote um, the girls. That was huge. She got a. I think she got like a, a one point three million dollar advance. So there was that also. A lot of people were a bit funny about that and it was about the Manson family but told by the two women who were kind of fictionalized characters I thought she did a really tasteful job she kind of um you know removed certain elements and I thought it was great um and then she got slammed by a couple of critics who were like why this material why this content like and also because you know, there's a sense of like, women should know better. They should be more sensitive and that sort of thing. And then a, another male author who wrote a, a very poetic kind of novel um, based on um, a true crime. And he's talking in the voice of three raped and brutally murdered teenage girls. And I was like, why has no one said anything about this? So they say something about that. Like, that's crazy to me, you know? Yeah, that's <laughs> that sounds much more. Yeah, it's a lot. It's like, I, I think it's a difference between you know, it's ventriloquizing the dead, which mm. I don't think is, yeah, I, I, I'm i personally not for that, but. Yeah, that's the point where it starts to get exploitative. Yeah, yeah that's what I think, yeah, yeah. Um, So this is obviously very satanic panic um, based and for anybody watching who doesn't know about satanic panic, it was a thing during the late 80s and early 90s, yeah. <laughs> people appearing on, um, national TV, especially in America, talking about how they had been growing up in satanic households and been richly abused and how these um, Satanists are out and about in the community and still performing these horrible rituals and things. And almost all of it was created from whole cloth that different, uh, I wouldn't say none, none of it existed, but a lot of it did. So um, that's enough, again, especially as you say, with um, some of this sort of stuff with the adrenochrome conspiracies that is coming through um Q QAnon that's another thing we how much yeah. do you have to balance because if you put the ideas out there pit they get they lodge in people's heads how much do you think about that when you're approaching these sorts of topics as it's happened at least twice in living memory that these ideas have taken off is that yeah, something that I you, you worry I, about I, putting I, it again well, no, I mean, I think because I really expose that as fraudulent and I think like, I think that that's, um, you know, I'm debunking a lot of that, you know, and, it's, and I'm trying to make it even comical at, at points too, you know. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't think, and I think also because it is in the zeitgeist, like even as I was writing that, I don't think I'd read anything or like that I can recall or like that there was anything. But then I started seeing all this stuff on it, like American Horror Story, for example, they started, you know, and it was like just all these kind of podcasts and, and all of these things. So it's sort of like, I guess that sort of thing, if we don't mention it, will it go away? It's never going to go away. It's just going to come back in different forms, you know, and especially also like I think with youth panic, it just takes different, um, you know, it's just in different manifestations and different forms. Um, but this particular thing that I find really interesting about the satanic panic 
and the QAnon and stuff, it's always involving children. And it's always like, um, you know, um, really sick, twisted stuff and sexualized stuff. And I've seen it a lot in um, posts on Twitter about people who are like, talking about anti-vax stuff and they're saying the most crazy stuff about things that happen to children and really like violent and sexual. And I find that really interesting because it's like, there's just this common theme and, you know, this desire to protect children, but, but transplanting and projecting all these disgusting, you know, ideas. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> you start to wonder how much of it is projection, how much it is oh, it fear and how much it's planted and yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think they said sort of, you know, the reading that I've done sort of said that the 90s, especially all the misery memoirs, is a lot of like um, people trying to kind of like, they're finally talking about trauma and abuse and things like that and, and um, you know, and childhood memory. And I think there was a lot of, um, with the satanic panic, there were a lot of adults that probably had gone through abuse who didn't have modes to express that and that was projected onto you know the the children their children and the country's children that's a really interesting idea <laughs> yes yeah. sorry no yeah. Just, yeah, sorry normally i would not stop to just wow good point <laughs> yes <laughs> now one other thing i did want to ask if nobody else has got any questions i might end on this one i'll give you a couple of minutes to think about it do i ask this question you do have a poe book in the background there you didn't steal that from a barnes yes. and noble did you <laughs> um i didn't steal it even though i'm not lying and i'm very i'm, I'm gonna say i was a childhood shoplifter um uh it actually has you can see <laughs> you've got proof yeah i bought it you can see oh no actually that's from tower, that's from tower records that is bex like it would have been a tape and it would have been his first loser and pay no mind and be a cat. Oh no, it's probably the CD. I probably bought the CD or the tape. Um, so that is from Barnes and Noble. And I did, so my mum used to give us like some money to go to the mall and like buy an ice cream or something. And I would just like save it up and buy books in Barnes and Noble. <laughs> and yeah, I, cause Americans love Poe, you know and I, I discovered him in class and I just became obsessed. And that was it for me. Like I was, I was done. Like I was like 10 and I was like, that's it. That's what I want to do. I want to be, I mean, I wanted to be a writer before that. I wanted to be a poet after that. And, and also the very dark revenge fantasies. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. He's so good at that. <laughs> so that's where, that's where you've ended up, that poetry. Yeah. And, and I also, and... I have, her, I can hear her scratching away at the door. I have a tortoise shell cat, like Poe. <laughs> um, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, yes. As long as everything works out much better for you than it did him as a writer. Yeah. <laughs> Much happier life yeah. for you. No, no, we, well, she's kept me warm. Once I did, we did have only blankets. We, we only had coats when we first moved back to Melbourne. We had like four coats and a blanket on us. I thought that was a very pro like situation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's good. You can romanticize that. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> At you the time, it. it's still horrible. <laughs> you just have to. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't think we've got any more questions from chat and no one's put their hands up to turn their cameras and stuff on. So um, thank you very much for that. That was great, super interesting. And um, yes, um, I'm going to be thinking about that point about um, transfer trauma a lot. That's going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, as you, as you watch your true crime shows. <laughs> yes. I'm not necessarily a massive true crime fan. My wife is, but yeah, so I, I get it all by us. There's always one. And there's always one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so again, thank you very much and um, I hope everything works out for you for the you trip so across. Much. I appreciate um, that. Thank you very much, thank Ruth. You. And thank okay. you all for coming. Take care. Thanks for having Bye. me. Okay. Bye.